I have feelings about this next guest that are so positive. And I didn't even realize what a big Red Sox and New England fan. And oh, man. This, is, this has to be your number one moment Absolutely. of the last two days. Absolutely. This man changed your life. Changed my life. Forever. Forever. When you win a World Series after never having won one in You're a almost forever. forever. The rest of time. That's it. He could do anything. Terry Francona could do anything. He could do anything. And he's done everything. Tito, thank you. <laughs> I love you. And you're a beautiful Thank ball you. band. Thank you. So uh, not, thank man. you. <laughs> Is there anything better, Terry? Welcome to the Rich Eisen Show. You're stuck with me. People don't know this, but as president of the Marlins for all those years, Terry and I have known each other since 1999, 2000. And I'm pretty sure when we've spoken, we never thought that we'd be speaking together on the Rich Eisen Show, <laughs> which is amazing and lucky for us and me and the audience. I was just last night talking to Josh Beckett. And guess what? We were talking about you. Uh-oh, my ears were burning. Your ears must have been burning. What you were able to do in corralling to win a World Series, I think that the most underrated thing that people don't get is the role of a manager. People, because you have to explain your X's and O's moves. But to me, when I'm evaluating managers, that's about 2% of the equation. It's about all the other stuff to get these players out on the field and get them to potentially hit 80% of their potential. And you were one of the greatest of all time doing that, Terry. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, I, I agree with you. I think, I think every market has different challenges for managers. And like you say, though, when you have good players, get out of the way and let good players play and just try to make it easier for them to play. It's hard to make it easier. There's so many distractions. I'm thinking about when you first started your career with the Phillies versus at the end of your career with the Guardians. The difference is jarring in the money the players had. The difference is jarring in the entitlement that some of the players had and your ability to both manage up and manage down, manage up into a front office, manage down into groups of players who may not appreciate sort of the position they have is another defining characteristic you had. And I think people underrate that when they're talking about managers and coaches. Can you just tell us, did you find that to be challenging as your career continued to unfold? You know, you raise a really interesting point. Times certainly have changed. You know, in 1997, when I was the manager of the Phillies, I remember going to uh, Ed Wade, and I wanted to get a thing that was called Inside Edge. It's kind of a new, newer, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, thing to kind of scout. And I believe it was five hundred dollars, and we didn't get the okay for that. And then you look up twenty years later at where the analytics have gone and how many people are involved, and you know, five hundred dollars seems like kind of a drop in the bucket. It's funny you say that because uh, old school managers, and you're both new school and old school, and you have to use analytics. We, we demanded that people use them as just an arrow in the quiver. I don't agree with being fully analytic, and I don't agree with ignoring the numbers, but people don't realize that you can't just, you have to look at heartbeat. Joe Torre, you and I once talked about heartbeat. I love that conversation. And people talk about it and slowing the game down. Do you do you like that as a concept? Do you evaluate players using that? I love I love what you just said. I think as a manager, as a coach, as a player, anybody, probably as a radio host, if you're ignoring some information, you're probably missing the boat. If you're relying on one part of information solely, you're probably also missing the boat. So what you try to do is if you have a question, get it answered correctly. And the best way to do that is by being well-rounded and using your eyes, using you know your brain, using technology, using video, and never forgetting for one minute that players are human beings. One thing that you and I have not spoken about, and I want to bring it up just ever so briefly, uh, was what happened with Trevor Bauer, and I don't mean after he left you. I'm talking about on the mound. One thing that I have talked about 
constantly with players over 18 years is understanding the chain of command, understanding when to make an issue. Because I didn't want to tell players to shut up and dribble, but I wanted them to understand where they can decide to not shut up and not dribble. And on the mound, when you're being taken out of a game, that doesn't strike me as the time to do it. Uh, I assume you had never seen anything like that in your entire career at that moment. It really stunned me. As a matter of fact, I wasn't sure. I thought I saw it, but I was like, there's no way that happened. (laughs) And you can imagine, and Trev right away knew that he probably had gone a little too far. And as you can see in that picture, he's trying to explain to me, and I'm, I wasn't having any of it. I said, well, we'll take care of it back in the underneath, behind the dugout. So that's what we did. You know, no one could have projected how that would have gone with Trevor. But one thing that you commanded was respect. And when the Red Sox were heading to their first World Series in 04, I, I know the pressure. I know what happened in 03 to the benefit of me with the Marlins and we beat the Yankees when you guys lost. Unfortunately, it wasn't your team. It was the Red Sox at that time uh, when they lost with, with the home run by Boone. But when you're taking over, <clears throat> having seen what happened with the team in 03, to a team that had not won in 782 years, what what are you thinking in your mind? Like, are you trying to put it out of your head, or are you making it clear in spring training, we we got to get this? You know, it, it's funny because I, I don't remember ever even talking about it. Um, I said the same thing, you know, in Cleveland. They kept asking, you know, because they hadn't won since 1948. And as you know, winning is hard enough as it is. And I didn't think it was fair to our players that my dad's teams couldn't win. Shoot, that's not their fault. So, (laughs) you know, just try to stay in the moment and win. And to be truthful, I was so excited to be the manager of that team because normally when you take over, you know, you're taking over for a team that had been struggling. That's why Mm -hmm. they make managerial changes. And this team was built to win. They just, you know, again, they got down to, you know, 03, and you saw all that, what happened. This team was really good. So it was an exciting time more than anything else. I once fired a manager of the year. So sometimes it sometimes mm-hmm. you can come in seriously. In 06, Joe Girardi won manager of the year, and we fired him. I'm not sure why that happened, because he was manager of the year. You were in charge. <laughs> I was in charge. I know exactly why it happened. <laughs> I'll stay away from that one. I'll leave that one to you. (laughs) Terry, you on a side note, and we don't have to say it now, you know what happened also. It is not a secret. I would like to talk to you about what you're doing with the the Invited Celebrity Classic. It's the third annual, and I'm looking at the list of people. This is nationally televised, a PGA Tour Champions competition. You've got PGA Tour champions. It didn't say anything about live players. We can talk about that after. You have sports and entertainment stars. But then I'm looking, and it looks like you got Glavin, and you got Smoltz, and you got Maddox. And those guys, they're good enough to be professional. But you put them in the celebrity category. How did you get all three of them? Yeah, you, you just made my my rear end pucker a little bit when you said it was going to be nationally televised. I got a hard enough time <laughs> playing when there's 10 people around. So um, I'm just, I'm kind of honored that they asked me. And I've never been able to do stuff like this because, you know, you're in the middle of your season and you're in the middle of your grind. And this is one of the kind of things I really wanted to do when I retired. And I trying to take advantage of it. Um, I've become really good friends with some of the guys on the Champions Tour, uh, even to the point where like Billy Andre and his caddy Zig, shoot, they stay with me when they were in Tucson. And we'd barbecue at night and some of the guys would come over. Some of the medical people would come over, people that I've known for years. And it's just, it, it's a really cool thing. They, they've gotten to a point in their career where they're so grateful for what they have and it's it really comes across well. So to be able to be a part of that for a couple of days, I'm really excited. I'm also nervous because if there's people around, my backswing will be a little tight. Well, what are the chances that you shank the first tee on national television? 50-50? Uh, <laughs> the chances just grew because you mentioned it. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's talking about a no-hitter, David. There's going to be millions of people watching. It's like going on the 18th at St. Andrews. There's always people there watching. Guys, so, I played uh, – Michael Jordan had a golf tournament 
uh, in Vegas. This was the year I was working at ESPN in 2012. And it wasn't televised or anything, but there was probably 100 people on the first tee. And they introduced me. And I remember trying to get the club head to go back. And I'm like, <laughs> take it back. take, And it wouldn't go. I was stuck. And that was only 100 people. So I am a little nervous about this. You're, are you a scout for the Cavaliers? No, but I love free stuff. As so, everybody in baseball I, does. Uh, that is true. There's a lot of free stuff. I'm still wearing, I have right now, I have Marlin socks on. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, man, that might be the worst thing about not being the manager. And and all my buddies here in town say the same thing. They're like, hey, man, we, we missed the free gear. And, you know, it's that's just part of it. It hurts. Oh, Terry, I'm going to help you right now. Here's how you keep getting free gear once you've been fired by the team, which you weren't fired. Of course, you retired because you're a Hall of Famer. Here's what you do. You call up the clubby. How easy is that? I actually was just talking to him this morning. <laughs> and I, I was dropping hints, so I think he knows. Oh, I think you can be more direct. Like, hey, send me a box of stuff. <laughs> because so, you're wearing Cavalier stuff. Are you a huge Cavaliers fan? Yeah, you know what? I'm a big I am. I I you know, because I was in Cleveland eleven years and you know, when LeBron was there, it was really easy. But then even after he left, I love what they're doing. I love how they've done it with youth. It kind of reminds me a lot of the Guardians and formerly the Indians. I just like the way they do things. They play defense. They go against the grain a little bit of the NBA, but they're proven that you can be successful that way. So, yeah, I am a fan. Brock, I just got word in my ear, and I it may not be accurate, but that what Terry said, what he was really trying to say there is that the Cavaliers are going to beat the Celtics. What? I no, no, I, I didn't just, say that. No, I, I could have sworn. I got it right <laughs> no, here. No, I didn't say that. Terry, we're tight. But come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm faithful. I'm not dumb. Um, <laughs> that might be a little difficult. A good line. That's a little too harsh given that the Celtics have been unable to close the deal ever with this group of players. They're and the, pretty good. They're they pretty are. good. But you've beaten, you know what it is to beat teams that in theory, as you know, teams, some of the parts, sometimes there are some X factors that come into play come playoff time. We know that above all in baseball. Winning World Series, it's hard. You need some two-out RBIs. You need some duck farts to go in. You need some things to happen that may not always happen. You know what, David, the way I have explained it to a lot of people is first of all, you got to really be good. And then you got to catch a break somewhere for sure. And, and, and then, and then you got to be good enough to take advantage of that break. Every team that you go back and look, that's one, there's usually a time in a series where we're like, wow, that's kind of a turning point or, you know, they really caught a break there, but then you also got to be good enough to take advantage of it. So this celebrity classic that you're participating in, it's April 19th to 21st, which is like two weeks from now at Las Colinas Country Club in Irving, Texas. It's going to be live on the Golf Channel all three days. How early are you going to get to Irving? Because I feel like you should maybe consider playing around prior to oh, the well, cameras. Well, they actually have two rounds with uh, like a pro-am with people that pay to just to want to play. And so that gives me a little bit of chance to practice. But Truth be told, if I play five days in a row, I'm going to be worse on the fifth day than I was on the first day. So, you know what, man, I'm just going to go ahead and, you know, every year, every year I've come home from baseball, I have to hit one more club the same distance. So it's kind of getting aggravating. So I can only get so good. So it doesn't matter if I practice or not. Don't, don't you miss now? I'm just going to get nostalgic. I miss, I did it way fewer years than you. I did it for 18 seasons. I miss the wins and losses. I miss the competition a lot. I miss the everyday grind. I miss the, and that's why I do a daily show because I'm trying to find a way to get that thought of the grind and the wins and losses. Do you miss it? No, you know what, David? And that's, I, I understand. Um, you know, in 2012, when I didn't work, it took me till about August to miss it. And when I started to miss it, I was like, okay, you know, maybe I'll do this again. I think I retired because the grind that you spoke about and the one that I almost craved, I started, it started to get the better of me. And after 44 years, it was just time. You know, I felt like there's a way to do the job right. And to do that, you got to be all in. And I was starting to waver a little bit and I didn't want to overstay my welcome. And I just thought that the time was right. 
And I thought it through pretty thoroughly. So to your point, I mean, I love the game and the game has been all I've ever had and I love it. But no, I really don't miss some of that stuff. One thing that Jack McKeon said to me, our World Series winning manager, who was uh, 70, when the oldest manager at the time prior to Dusty winning with the Astros was the oldest manager to win a World Series. I told him that the losses were bothering more than the wins were making me happy. And he said that was another sign that maybe it's time for Jeter to fire you because that's, that's very bad. You don't want that to happen. I was it getting angry. To, it ha you know what? You're right. When you, when you win, you're almost relieved. But when you lose, you're devastated. And, you know, Jim Leland's a guy that I've looked up to for so long. And, and I called him and talked to him and bent his ear a little bit just because I know he had kind of gone through similar stuff. And he was really helpful. And like I said, I thought it through pretty thoroughly. And I feel pretty good about what I did. Well, now you get a chance to be in this golf tournament. And I just want to pump it because I want to put as much pressure on you as possible. <laughs> I want to get as many people watching the Golf Channel. I want to say that you can get complimentary grounds tickets all three days of the tournament. Just register at invitecelebrityclassic.com. And you can watch Terry Francona on the first tee. You can just see him grip it and rip it. I, 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 there's, I may a come. Pretty, there's a pretty good chance that TV camera is not going to be on me on the golf course. You named guys like Maddox, Glavin, and Smoltz, and I think I'll be able to blend into the background pretty well. Shoot, they might even think I'm the caddy. Oh, I think <laughs> when I look at the list, Tony Romo's on it and Pujols and Erlacher. Pudge Rodriguez, you're going to see Pudge. Tell him hello. I, I would put you in the top echelon of icons with all of these celebrities who are committed to this, I think that you are underselling, and I love that you're trying to do this, but it's not working, and our audience <laughs> isn't gonna buy it. You are one of the most accomplished managers in the history of Major League Baseball. Well, that's very kind of you, but on the golf course, it might be a different story. Um, I am excited. I mean, and just to see some of the guys you just named, and it's amazing to me. I played in a, in an event a couple of years ago in uh, it was called the Diamond Resorts in Orlando, and it it amazed me how friendly everybody was. And like I saw Brian Erlacher, and remember thinking, man, I don't want to bother him. And he was so upbeat and so friendly. Super nice guy. It it, it and it kind of was like that across the board. He's a big guy, Erlacher. Oh, uh, yeah. You wouldn't want to piss him off. No. And I was imagining what it would be like to be hit by him running <laughs> with him running at full speed and with pads on. And David, it would I end badly a, for us. I got a little funny story if we have time where, you know, you have to walk. And after at the last day on Sunday, man, I was hurting, you know, walking that many days. And everybody knows about my health. And we had got backed up on 18. And Marcus Allen was playing in front of me. And Marcus is as. I mean, you talk about a gentleman and friendly and he was sitting on a little soda box there, you know, and I said, Marcus, I said, you're not that big, man. I said, how'd you feel on Monday? And he looked up without even skipping a beat. And he said, about like you look right now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's that an insult. I think that can't be a compliment. I, can we talk about the rule changes? You and I have been around pre-rule changes, post-rule changes in baseball. Uh, there were many days. I think that I would have had a better family life if the game times weren't 335 every single night, getting home on a Tuesday at 1 a.m. And now you're looking at 220s all the time. I assume that you're loving it as the rest of the country is. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Um, you know what? When you're, when you're playing or your manager, you go where they tell you when they tell you. But when they make it a little bit easier for everybody, that's that's a good thing. I always wanted, I would yell from the president's suite or the GM suite. I'd yell the players to get in the box. I'd yell the pitchers, toe the rubber, man. Like, like let's go. And I, I wanted, because pace to me matters. And I understand that we want the pitchers to sometimes gain their composure. I always understood that players try, when you're a hitter, try to get the pitcher out of rhythm. But really, when it's about habit, doing your doing your batting gloves and all the other stuff they do, that's not strategic. That's habitual. And I think we've done a great job of getting rid of that. I, I think we were part of the blame, though, as an industry, because, you know, we, we all of a sudden we had walk up songs. And, you know, I think one thing led to another. And I know we're kind of slow with change. 
but I think they did a really good job because I think it's good for the game. I don't know. I don't think quicker has to be the goal. I think better has to be the goal, but not so much dead time is certainly going to make the game better. We actually, Terry, uh, you may remember this. We call the pace of action, not pace of play inside the industry. Which makes a lot of sense to me. We wanted more action. And, and that's what fans want. And we've seen it with an increase in attendance everywhere but Oakland. We've seen it with a great situation happening with people engaging in baseball better, which is always a positive thing because we have a season underway. Who do you root for when the Guardians play the Red Sox? Well, I still work for the Guardians. So, so who I, do you root I, for? That's an easy one, man. I'm <laughs> Cleveland through and through. Um, I certainly have fond memories of everything but the way it ended in Boston. Um, but I'm, I mean, I spent 11 years in Cleveland and I'm still an employee. A lot of the coaches are still the same guys that I was with. You can't spend 11 years in a place. I mean, shoot, man, there's some of my best friends in, in the whole world that are still there. I love that fact. I had a hard time. The other time I knew I was ready to leave sports is when I rooted against so many teams. The teams were playing each other and I wanted a tie. <laughs> because you've been around like every National League East team. You just want them to lose every time. And when you manage multiple teams, multiple divisions, you're loyal to Cleveland. It's hard then to root for teams. You know, David, I found when we would lose, I'd go home at night and I tried to figure out a way where every other team would lose. And <laughs> <Me> I, <too. laughs> it, as you as you found out, it's impossible because you just can't tie. But it was just you get miserable. It's funny. I would root for rainouts. All these retractable roofs totally really did me in <laughs> because I could root for the game just not to be played because there's situations like when Atlanta would play the Mets. Right. I can't possibly have any of those teams win. Whoever came up with, you know, misery loves company knew what they were talking about. <laughs> That's for sure. Hey, listen, Terry, thank you. I want to just say that you are playing at the Invited Celebrity Classic, nationally televised on the Golf Channel, PGA Tour Champions competition, 78 PGA Tour champions, a bunch of amazing celebrities led by Terry Francona, and then those other guys, lots of other cool guys. Complimentary grounds tickets still available, so get them and watch Terry. Terry, good luck. We're going to be following, and uh, we'd like to see you, you know, break 100. Oh, I can do that. Then great. But, then you're a winner. But if I can just finish the third day, I'll that, I'll consider that a big win. <laughs> it is so good to see you and talk to you. The privilege is all of ours. Thank you, Terry. David, thank you so much. I'll see you, man. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern for free.